Hello and welcome to Counterpoint. I'm your guest host, Michelle Smart, and today's show is about the Conservative Party of Canada's leadership race results. Today we have Michael Diamond, political commentator and founding principal Upstream Strategy Group, and Sabrina Maddo, political commentator and columnist for the National Post. Welcome, Michael and Sabrina. Thanks for having me. So, uh, Polyev's win was a landslide. Michael, what are your thoughts on the first round victory? Look, I think it's really good for the Conservative Party of Canada moving ahead, both in terms of the fact that Pierre Polyev, uh, who, who obviously won, uh, did so in every right in every province. Uh, he lost. Uh, he he lost only eight electoral districts uh, in, in the entire country: six in Quebec and two in Ontario. So his 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 win was decisive. It was regionally and uh, I, I, regionally diverse. Uh, it was uh, pronounced in every province, and it happened on the first ballot, which is really important because if you look at the last two Conservative Party leadership elections, uh, the, the Maxime Bernier versus Andrew Scheer and Aaron O'Toole versus Peter McKay, they were both a lot closer. In the case of the Bernier and Scheer, it was really a, a nail biter of result, and it left the party fractured in a 50-50 split almost of uh, of candidates having to uh, appeal to other candidates for down ballots support and be indebted to them, uh, and, and then having, you know, two poles of the party. Paul Liam got 70% of the popular, of the uh, raw votes. Uh, he did it without having to appeal to any uh, yeah. special interest groups in the party, and that's going to carry him well into the next election. Sabrina, what do you think of Mr. Polyev's win? I think it's the best thing that could have happened for the Conservative Party in that it was so decisive. Um, him winning with just over 68% of the vote, where his nearest challenger, Jean Charest, had only 16%. This wasn't even close. Um, as Michael said, broad support from across the country, from across all demographics. Um, for the first time in a while, the Conservatives have a leader who have a who has a real mandate and can bring everyone together to move forward um, and not being beholden to any special interest groups, whether it's dairy farmers, whether it's an I ideological special interest group like social conservatives. Um, this gives him a lot of room to move forward and create policies that he believes can win a general election um, rather than constantly trying to have to manage the party from within. Yes, and I, I agree with you, because I think uh, with the last two leadership uh, races, there was a little bit of, um, shall we say, split on the vote. There wasn't a clear, clear win from the leader. And when Andrew Scheer was the leader, uh, we had a leader who many people labeled him as a social conservative. And again, that is just, you know, party politics and what they do is labeling. But at the end of the day, he was still the leader and he tried getting the vote. And, and frankly, he got the popular vote. But in the end of the day, he didn't win. And then we had uh, Aaron O'Toole, which again, did not win in a landslide like Pierre Poliev. And his team tried to, I guess, pivot in a certain way where they positioned him in, in, in a spot, but then when they knew that he had to be for the general electorate, he had a different position. So what does that mean for the party now that we have a clear, clear mandate? It was a huge landslide for Pierre Poliev. What does this mean for the party? Uh, we'll start with you, Sabrina. It means that they will all be coming together under one banner. There was some current concern before the leadership convention that um, there would be a big split afterwards, but we haven't seen that. There's been no mass exodus from the party, no signs of a mass exodus or a new centrist party forming. So everyone's going to come together and work towards a common goal, which is, of course, defeating Justin Trudeau in a primary, uh, sorry, in a general election. And this allows them to focus. And I think not being, again, beholden to any one specific demographic for this win really allows them to tailor policy that's resonating with the general public. I think that we've seen some paths that could help the Conservatives win the next election, such as appealing to non-voters, appealing to young people. Um, they have to do more to appeal to women. Um, and those are demographics they should be focusing on going forward. Okay, yeah, no, I agree with you on the demographics point. Um, I think it's a, it's a different ball game now with a clear mandate. So, uh, Michael, uh, do you how do you feel, and what does this mean for the party? You got uh, fifteen seconds. Look, I think it, it's really good because, uh, as you said, it's uh, it, it's a, a clear mandate free of strings. He's not beholden to any special interest groups of the party because he, frankly, he won them all on his own merit. 
Okay, great. Thank you. So um, we're going to be right back with our break, and then we're going to talk about the next leader. Uh, we're going to talk about the candidate, uh, candidates who didn't win. So thank you. We'll be back right soon. Welcome back. We're here with Michael Diamond and Sabrina Madhu, and we were talking about the Conservative Party of Canada's leadership race. And we were talking about how Pierre Poilievre won a landslide victory. But that being said, there were other valuable candidates in the race. And I, I just think that it's important that we talk about, you know, what they offer to the party and will it make a difference in the party? So Sabrina... Uh, how do you feel about the other candidates who ran and, and where do you think they're going to go move forward? I think it was a big asset for the Conservatives to have such a strong slate of candidates um, who represented different factions of the Conservative Party so that pu the public really got to see that there's debate within the party, um, that conservatism can mean different things and it doesn't have to be a one size fit all. So when we're talking about a big tent going forward, I think this positions them well, assuming everyone continues to unite and move forward together. Um, in terms of the overall demographics, just the fact that they had so many new members sign up, that voter turnout was relatively high, that shows there's a movement, there's momentum. And if Pierre's team can sustain that going into a general, that's going to be extremely powerful. Uh, Jean Charest came in second with 16% of the vote, which was quite interesting. But the most interesting part is that he did not win overwhelmingly in Quebec or even win the most Quebec ridings, period. Um, I believe Pierre won all but six ridings in Quebec, which shows that he has that ability to reach out beyond the West. Um, another interesting candidate to look at was Roman Babber, who did quite well, and he garnered quite a bit of support, although it was still a low percentage of the overall numbers. You can tell on social media in terms of the rank ballots, like he, he has some momentum as well, and I believe we'll see him run probably for um, a federal position whenever the next election is, and perhaps he'll play a prominent role in the party going forward. Uh, the third thing is it was a bit surprising to some people how poorly Leslin did after quite a good showing the last time she ran for leader, and that could be indicative of um, a diminishing um, presence for social conservatives within the party, and perhaps their um, power and their role as kingmaker or queenmaker isn't quite as big as it once was. Yeah, it's possible. I, I hear you. Um, I think I, I agree with you. I think that it was a little surprising to see Leslin's uh, results being as low as they were. Um, her threshold between Roman Babber and her was quite small. And, and frankly, I mean, this was her second go of it. And you would have expected that maybe she would have gained momentum. But if anything, she didn't get it. So, Michael, what are your thoughts about that? Look, I, I think specifically for Dr. Lewis, running was a mistake. She uh, was in very good position to be a leader within the party, not the party leader, but a leader within the party and within the caucus based on last uh, her last result, which was very situational. She was running against two candidates who were, frankly, neither uh, resonated greatly with uh, with the base uh, and, and the membership was a very lackluster race during, a, during the actual you know, uh, shutdown period of the pandemic. So she benefited from all that and she should have ridden those coattails into a future leadership role within the party instead of another campaign for leader where she did, frankly, quite a bit worse uh, than, than she did in the last go around. So I think for her, uh, definitely a miscalculation in running. Uh, I would definitely agree with Sabrina. Roman Babber did very well, uh, yeah. considering that he was relatively unknown. He uh, was seen by many as a single issue uh, candidate. And uh, uh, to get 5% of points, uh, over 5% of points, is nothing to sneeze at. And I think he definitely, if he wants it, has a future within uh, the federal conservative uh, 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 party uh, heading into the next election, which is a, a certainly a, a win for him, considering where the trajectory of his political career and how he left Queen's Park here here uh, in, in Ontario. Jean Charest is another one. You know, this is someone who I personally have a great deal of respect for. You know, I'll, I'll remember forever uh, his uh, convention speech in 1992 when I think I was in grade, uh, I was actually in grade two, in 93, sorry, when I was in grade two, but I'll remember that speech forever and I'll remember his campaigning during the 1995 referendum and as a leader of the PC Party of Canada in 1997. 
unfortunate result for him. You know, a guy who I have mad respect for and I think is has been a great public service for Canada. He just, you know, situationally, you know, this was a hurricane and uh, he could not have seen this when he got in, just uh, the momentum Pierre was going to have uh, and, and just really had a bit of a lackluster campaign. And unfortunately, he had some really good uh, policy initiatives that he was champion in. But in terms of, you know, the execution, the field operations of the campaign, my understanding is, uh, you know, he uh, actually was outsold in several provinces in terms of membership sales by by Roman Babber. And so coming from, you know, Captain Canada to 16% of the uh, points allocated in the Conservative uh, leadership election is certainly disappointing, but I, I personally hope has no uh, bearing on his great legacy for this country. Yeah, you know what? I agree with you. I think that he was an underdog that nobody expected. And he raised himself to a degree that now he's a contender. And so we look forward to seeing what Roman does next. But uh, that being said, we're going to take a break and we're going to talk about uh, moving forward. Welcome back. We're here with Michael Diamond and Sabrina Meadow. And we were talking about the leadership, uh, Conservative Leadership Party, Party race and Pierre Polyev winning. Since becoming the leader on September 10th, Mr. Polyev has been out and about talking about uh, his policies and what he wants for Canada with the people and giving interviews. There has been a lot of commentary on Mr. Polyev. And Michael, what do you think about Mr. Polyev's media attention, how people are perceiving him? Well, I think, you know, there's no group more uh, obsessed with Pierre's strategy around media than media itself. Uh, I think he obviously has a rat message that's resonating with Canadians and is punching through uh, to Canadians. So the fact that he's not doing interviews and the, uh, you know, the uh, five o'clock shows on CBC and CTV with national media doesn't mean that he's not actually talking to media and that his message isn't getting through. His use of social media is uh, light years ahead of any other pol politician uh, or political party in Canada right now. So full credit to him on that in terms of his interaction with media throughout the leadership campaign. He did not go to a center without talking to local media. So he certainly is talking to media. He's just not talking to media necessarily in the way that the Ottawa uh, press gallery, the parliamentary press gallery expects a politician to. And I think, you know, he's leading the pack here. They should get ready for others to be following that because there's definitely more impactful ways of getting your message through. And he's just uh, an early adopter. Agreed. I think that like you said, he had a plan and he's still executing his plan. Despite winning the leadership, his plan has not changed, which is one of the many things that people have written about him, talking about how when you get Pierre, this is who he is. He doesn't falter, he doesn't change, which many people criticized Aaron O'Toole and his team, where it's like he pivoted and he changed. And many people comment saying, what you get is what you see. And at the end of the day, uh, I think that it has some resonating with especially people within the party, but I think maybe some people for the general populace. Sabrina, what are your thoughts on the recent uh, Globe and Mail opinion piece on Pierre Polyev's rise to leader, uh, to leader of the Conservative Party? Because it talked about him from his young, uh, I guess, career getting into Parliament and then now where he is right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's interesting because as familiar as we in media and, you know, political circles are with Pierre, the average Canadian still doesn't really know who he is. They might have heard the name, but they don't really know what he stands for or what his background is or any of his personal story. So to get to know those details, like he was adopted, his father then was divorced and came out as gay, um, that his wife, Anna, is an immigrant um, and just all these details that aren't typical of a politician in Ottawa who were used to coming from a certain wealth class with certain connections, I think will um, lend authenticity to a lot of his messaging because he's talking about, you know, fighting the gatekeepers, inflation, affordability. Um, he has said, you know, he is he's in support of gay marriage. He is not anti-choice. And those are issues that the left wing has often been able to attack previous conservative leaders on. And when you have these real touch points in his story, um, it's going to be a lot harder for them to sell those wedge issues and those attacks when he can point to saying, hey, I'm not anti-immigrant. Look at my wife. I'm not anti-gay marriage. Look at my dad. Um, I think that's going to be very, very powerful as Canadians get to learn more about his background. And frankly, he's not even anti-abortion. Um, because he recently came out and said, uh, you know, he's pro-choice. 
And so at the end of the day, I think that was a major sticking point for uh, a lot of people. And so now you have somebody who's not pivoting, who's still sticking with what he had said. Um, and these are touch points, like you mentioned, that will resonate with other people. But at the same point, he also has had touch points with um, the conservative base, especially uh, the social conservative base, which I think um, holds a lot of weight within the conservative party. Um, and even though there's a lot of new members, at the end of the day, he still needed to get the vote. And he won by a landslide, which is a clear mandate. Do both of you think that Pierre can win with other swing voters? Absolutely, I do. I think if you look at uh, his, his appeal, uh, unlike Andrew Scheer, for example, lost in 2019, in part because he fought the previous election. He was fighting yesterday's battle. Uh, Pierre Pauly has been talking about the issues of today and what is impacting Canadians with his proposed solution, be it uh, grocery prices, be it uh, home, home ownership, uh, a number of other issues, be it passport offices. He's talking about the issues that are impacting folks today and he can continue to do that. And that's the keys for him to win a uh, majority government, not focus on conservative pet projects, not focus on personal prep projects, but on the voters' concerns. Agreed. At the end of the day, people don't want to hear about what's important to the conservative people. They want to hear what's important to them as everyday people. Because at the end of the day, when you elect a leader, it's a leader who runs the country. That being said, we'll be right back. Welcome back. We're here with Michael Diamond and Sabrina Madhu, and we were talking about the Conservative Party of Canada's leadership race. We were talking about how Pierre Polyev won a landslide victory. And we're talking about what it means for Canada and for the people. There is talk that Canadians may not have to wait till 2025 for an election. That if it may come sooner than later, if the Liberal and NDP alliance could fall apart, if Trudeau doesn't hold his end of the bargain, which is possible given the fact that he said he may run again as leader, what does that mean for the Conservative Party and will they be ready for the next election? Sabrina. Yeah, I think it's interesting. On one hand, if the election doesn't come till two, 2025, there's the question of how does Pierre keep up this environment of really charged emotion and momentum going forward for that long. But if an election comes sooner, the challenge is that a lot of Canadians, especially Canadians who might be swing voters, probably aren't that familiar with him. So they really have to hit the ground running with introducing him and his story to Canadians um, across the political spectrum. And he's his campaign's very good at doing that, especially because they can go direct to voters on social media and they're very talented communicators. So I don't see that being too much of a hurdle. Um, the other thing is what other candidates are going to run. I mean, ultimately, yes, people are focused on the leader, but they're also focused on who's going to be their local MP. And I think re-energizing the offering of conservatives across the country. And, you know, he's been very appealing to young people, to non-voters bringing in outsiders. I think there should be some sort of concerted, concerted effort to um, bring in new voices at all levels of the party. Agreed. And Michael? Oh, look, I think, you know, if, if the election is to happen soon, whomever is responsible for triggering that election will pay a price at, at the polls, at the polls. So I don't think, you know, if the prime minister was to uh, call an early election, an unnecessary election, as voters may see it, like he did last time, he will be punished. Likely, uh, similarly, if opposition leaders cause that election, they too will be punished. So I think the election is still not for a while, but I think Pierre, by focusing on the zeitgeist, by having his pulse firmly on what the concerns are of folks today and his ability to punish their media uh, uh, to get his message directly to voters, will stand a very good chance at uh, uh, not just winning, but uh, winning in a dramatic fashion uh, and changing the political map, similar to how Doug Ford did here in Ontario uh, this past spring. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, again, uh, there's not a politician who has a grasp of the zeitgeist better than Mr. Polyev, and I, I do not see that changing. Uh, time will certainly be uh, an asset for him or any challenger, uh, but I think both of those things together will square up for a very uh, uh, potentially successful election for the Conservative Party of Canada. Sabrina? Yeah, I'd say there's much better than a chance. Uh, the public is increasingly disillusioned with Trudeau and the Liberals. We see his approvals going down every time there seems to be a poll on them. And at the same time, Pierre has all this forward momentum, this emotion, this 
you know, also common sense, like issues that impact your daily life message. And both of those trends converging, I think, could look very promising for the Conservative Party whenever the next election happens. Yes, because, you know, in Ontario, um, you know, when Mike Harris became Premier of Ontario, uh, he won based on the common sense revolution. And many people gravitated, whether they understood it or they didn't understand it. They like the term common sense. And so at the end of the day, uh, again, not taking from, you know, Mike Harris's uh, pitch, but it is possible, and it, 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 I, I see what's happening right now with uh, some of the comments that he's making, that really going to the heart of what is important to Canadians will make the difference. So we'll see what happens. If an election comes sooner than later, uh, the Conservative Party, I think, will be ready for it. Uh, in one word, do you agree or disagree, Michael? Agree. And Sabrina? Definitely agree. Okay, so then I guess we're going to look forward to what happens in the next uh, couple of months because it is very possible we'll have an election sooner than later. And I know the electorate will probably be very unhappy to have another election because truly it costs a lot of time, costs a lot of money. And frankly, people don't have the time to vote all the time because they have jobs. And so people just want real solutions for real problems so thank you for both of you for coming in. That's our time for today. And we're very happy to have both of you on the show. And hopefully we'll have you on soon when Tony Granite comes back in October and you'll discuss more issues. So thank you again. Thank, thank you. you.